for those of you who don't, don't know me, so I'm Phil Lancaster. I'm a financial advisor. And as part of what I do, it works very well with CC in terms of giving financial advice and what we both do together. But something we're both passionate about is charitable activities that people do and also supporting charities. So that's where we conceived this idea. Uh, I guess, do you want to introduce yourself now, CC? Is that Oh yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I think these are lots of new faces for me, which is very exciting. So I'm Cece. I own um, Brilliant Estate Planning. i um, known Phil for a couple of years now. And actually, my business will be two next month. So that's very exciting. I was just thinking about that earlier. Um, yeah, and I've done like a lot of stuff with charities before. Um, pandemic, obviously, I was doing mostly like in-person fundraising events, which is, I think, what most charities did. So it's uh, it's been a bit of like a learning curve, I think, for everybody. And obviously, the people that I know that like work for charities and stuff have like expressed that obviously they're having like a really hard time. Um, and so Phil and I have done like we did a webinar um, with Grace House and stuff to try and like help spread awareness and raise funds and things in Allura there. Um, and just try to kind of come up with different ideas um, based on what we've put into practice like in the olden times, in the before times, and then the way that things are now. So we figured, well, we'll just put together kind of our ideas. Um, and things that we know about that um, that you might not know about are just sort of like different kind of twists and, and ways to kind of stretch funds and speak with like existing donors and things like that. And uh, just try to help <laughs> as much as we can, uh, like keep charities afloat and hopefully um, even like become more profitable. So yeah, we put this together and I'm really excited that y'all are here. So I guess that, that was Part of the thing we we're trying to do today was make it really positive when we were talking about setting the scene it's, it's really easy to talk about everything's unexpected everything's uncertain it's unprecedented we hear all these negative phrases but actually the demand for activities that charities provide has never been more more so and we see this on the news all the time and we hear about people wanting to give and th there's there's pros and cons to that because people are wanting to do more but uh, kind of giving to selective causes. So we hear a lot about uh, Captain Tom, for example, and how much he raised. But actually, there's so many other causes out there. It's trying to get your voice heard at a time when uh, there's just so much noise out there and it's difficult to use this tried and tested channels that we've always done. So in my job, I always did physical networking and that's not been possible. So it's how do we get out and meet people and talk to people and what are we talking to them about? And really what we didn't want to focus on, which we, we could have done, is all, all those tools that you already have available. So you've already got potentially properties and trading activities that you can do. You potentially got some cash or emergency funds, how you're making those work for yourself. You've potentially got some committed funds, some endowments that need investing. We could have done hours on those and I, I would have loved to, but that's not what this is about. This is about how can we give you something new or some new ideas and share some best practices that might work for you and your charity? And it's, it's going to be different depending on what it is the charity does, what it is you as an individual are interested in, how you can engage as well. So because there is such a range of things, we're not going to talk about them all. We're just going to focus on a few. But if there's anything else that you think, actually, I just want to talk to Phil and Cece and see what their experience is of that or how it can help or leverage that, just let us know. So today's agenda is a bit morbidly going through a kind of a, a life cycle of investor. Again, trying to tick all the boxes of when you can talk to somebody and what they're going to be interested in in terms of their giving. So it's, we're going to focus on young kind of first time givers effectively, people who are more established and potentially already give to charity, how we can get more out of them. And then the final one is actually what happens in a kind of a legacy scenario when people aren't around the fact that they can still give even on death. And I guess if, if there's two things you can do, you can either get people to give more or give more frequently. If we could do that for everybody, then there'd be no issues. So I guess 
does that, what's your experience, uh, Helen and Lisa, of those kind of three areas? Is that something you already do or are interested in? Um, I think it's, for me, um, payroll giving and, and gift aid is definitely something I'm interested in learning more about because it we, we do very little with gift aid at the minute. Um, I haven't tried anything with payroll giving, um, so would be very interested to look into that. Legacy giving is a bit of a, a tricky one for us, um, just because of the, our charity supports people with learning disabilities, um, and we provide support to people who've been kind of subject to financial abuse and stuff in the past. So it's a bit of an awkward one for us, particularly in terms of that. That and, and there's a consent issue and stuff and. I'm not sure whether that's right for us, but certainly payroll given and gift aid, definitely. So I'm going from the other side of the scope, I guess. I'm working for First Contact Clinical, if you know it, the social enterprise. No? Okay, so it's based in South Shields, it's in the Northeast region. Um, but I'm like access, letting, helping people, linking people in with voluntary sector and charities. So I'm going from the other side of the scope, I guess. Um, it's still interesting to hear all of this, to be honest, and seeing where like, I could maybe fit in and express people to get them into that way. Great. Well, if we check on the first one, so I guess it was interesting to me to see how people still give at the moment. And this was something that uh, CAF have on their website, is how to individuals typically give to charity, I guess. Strikingly, I, I was I didn't expect cash to be that high, but obviously it's the buckets outside uh, sports events, you know, uh, on the till, all those small bits help. But in a society at the moment where we can't go out and where personally I haven't used cash in pretty much all year, I've just used debit cards <laughs> and online, uh, buying goods, raffle tickets, all those things that require you to go out, be physically there and in front of somebody aren't available at the moment. So working our way right to the bottom, <laughs> you can see payroll giving there 2%. So I guess the interesting question is, why, why am I focusing on this if it's something that's kind of so little in terms of the overall society, how we give at the moment? And I think that's because it's A, fallen out of vogue and people have stopped talking about it. People don't understand it and aren't really talking about the benefits of it. So payroll giving is, has multiple names, give as you earn, uh, they're all the same thing. I guess from my perspective as a financial advisor, I always talk about it from a tax perspective, which isn't very interesting at all, but just take my word for it, it's very tax efficient. <laughs> so it's, it's the opposite of uh, gift aid. With gift aid, you give to a charity from your taxed income, you have to reclaim it. Payroll giving, you give before tax. So that's the simplest way to explain it. I guess why it's in decline is because it used to be a massive thing for big companies to do. All big companies would talk about payroll giving and offer it. But charities, from my experience, especially in the uh, financial sector, aren't going into companies and actively promoting this as an option to them. So we'll talk about that in a second. I guess just to finish off the tax perspective, it, it's a bit like order enrollment for your pensions. It's something that people will sign up to and give a small amount it comes off before your tax, therefore you end up giving more and it's just there and it's done. It's the last thing people cancel. So if you can get somebody to set up five pounds a month going into a charity and something happens like a pandemic, they're least likely to cancel their regular contributions. So as soon as you get this set up, it's a really powerful way to actually have uh, a good annuitized revenue stream. And I, I do this, so St. James's Place, who I work with, they have a foundation. They encourage all of uh, everyone who's under the St. James's Place umbrella to contribute to the foundation. They make it really easy. It's a one page tick box. You can do it online that says how much would you like to give and how regularly. So I give five pounds a month. It's that easy. You can also give one off as well. So when St. James's Place then do events, they can say, would you like to give a bit more? Because we're at an event. You've seen how powerful the foundation is. You've seen what the charity does. Would you like to give an extra 25, 50, 100 pounds? And again, it's a tick box. And because you've got those details, it's automatic. So you can see if you go into a small company, you can sign up two, three people to something regular or one off. If you go into a bigger company and the larger the organization gets, you're just multiplying that effect. 
and these direct debits and contributions are just going to stay there for years or as long as the people are employed, hopefully, as long as you keep engaging with our workplace. So when I was putting these slides together, I, I immediately went to the, the tax advantages, which, let's be honest, isn't very attractive, isn't, isn't a reason why a company would ever talk to you or an individual would ever give. What they're really interested in is what's the benefits, what's the emotional impact of giving. And so there's, there's three stakeholders to payroll giving. There's the individual at the top, there's the company themselves, and then the charity. And I guess the hardest one to get talking to is that middle box, the charity, the, the company itself. So let's say you target Philip Lancaster and Lancaster Wealth and Investment Management. You say, look, you're a massive enterprise, you've got 20 people, what are you doing for charity? And I go, absolutely nothing at the moment. It's a bit ad hoc. Uh, I put some money in the RNLI box occasionally, and when someone does a run, I sponsor them. I'm very reactive. What we want is to change that, con that conversation from reactive giving and one-off events to proactive. That's the whole kind of theme of today. So proactive giving is what, what are you as a company? What do you stand for? In Lancaster Wealth and Investment Management, we want to help people financially be more educated, and so the education sector is a huge one for me and want to help people there. So you say, well, actually, I'm a charity that engages in that. How about giving something to us in terms of not just your time and your expertise, but also monetary? And you say, yep, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Some of those things I've put there are kind of the benefits for the company. It's going to be about uh, external promotion. So some companies obviously give so they can tell everyone else how fantastic they are at giving. You can apply for a payroll giving quality mark award. Basically, it's something you put on the bottom of your email or your website, but that's not going to be the reason people give. What they really want is they want something that's going to help help the charity as much as possible, hence it's tax efficient, but also get everyone else in the organization excited. And it's not just about having those one-off bake sales. It's that regular engagement and excitement that they can get from it as well. So staff retention, staff engagement, staff attraction as well. When you're really engaged with a charity and you do great things and you're raising large amounts of money, that's what you want to talk to them about. For the charity for yourselves, it's, it's about having multiple people to talk to. So if you talk to Phil Lancaster, you're talking to one person. If you say, can I talk to all the staff and have all of their time about signing up to payroll giving, you've got 5, 10, 15, 20 people. So your audience already multiplies. You've also then got 10, 20, 30 people who are going to be loyal, regular donors and are going to start earning more and more throughout their lifetime and have different needs. So you're going to build up a loyal donor base. And there's going to be opportunities to engage with new, new employees as well. So whenever I hire somebody new, you can say, actually, if they signed up to the payroll giving, do I, there should be a process where you talk to every new employee about what this means to them. And lastly, when you're talking to the employee or the person who's actually going to be giving, it's about what work the charity does, how easy it is to give, and what, what a, effects that donation is going to have. That's really why I give. If, when I give five pounds regularly to the foundation, it's because I know that's going into a collective pot. If I'm giving 30 pounds to a local charity, like your charity, Lisa, I know exactly where it's going because you'll probably tell me it's going towards renovating this or this program. And that's what the emotional side is all about. So payroll giving to my mind is really simple. It's, it's really easy to do. There's, there's free software that people can use. The co-op are great at this in terms of offering a free payroll giving service solution. So I'll put a link in my previous slide to them. It's just about engaging with the companies and talking to them and not having that kind of fear of saying, I don't just want to talk to you as the company owner. I want to get everybody in your company together and see what we can collectively do. And it's not just about painting that room or doing a garden build together. It's about what can we do for the long term in terms of one, two, three years together. What's your thoughts on that in terms of a, an opportunity to talk to people who, especially employee-wise, are typically seen as cash poor, time poor, people who haven't regularly given in the past engaging with them as new people? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry. <laughs> I'm really interested in this as a, an opportunity to start kind of getting out there and talking to companies about, because um, that's, that's something that we don't do particularly well is to either work with companies or work with individuals to encourage regular donations. We're very much reactive as well in terms of kind of one-off donations coming in, people 
and they're signing up ad hoc to do things for us, which is great. But what I would like to get started with is, is something that, that's regular that we know is, is kind of coming in monthly that kind of makes us a bit more secure in terms of generating that income. Yeah, and cool. the, the benefit, like I said, is with St. James's Place, they're, they're great in terms of once you signed up to payroll given, they tell you how the charity is doing as well, how the foundation is doing, what impact it's having. And they always talk about if you gave more, what more impact could that have? Yeah. So it goes from being a £5 donation a month to being £10 a month. So if, if you said at the beginning, I can get £120 a month from somebody who's never been engaged in my charity, it's £120 a year, sorry that would be huge and if you knew they weren't going to change that and they were going to be engaged with your charity and start talking about it the multiplier effect is massive yeah. so that's why i think this is a really good uh, proposition it's not something new but it's something that like i said has gone out of fashion and people aren't talking about it so by you going in and talking to companies it looks like something new to the majority of people so that was that was the first idea the, the second one that Again, if you talk to me, I, I, I get bogged down in the tax and the technical aspects of it. But really what gift aid and capital gains tax relief should be about is about talking to your large donors about why they should give more and how they can give more efficiently. So when you, this is something I come across a lot when talking to charities is they often rely on a large number of people that they'll go out to and say, we've got a fundraising uh, idea can we come to you? And you know who you can rely on and they'll give the same amount pretty much every time and usually quite generous gifts. But what we're not tapping into is A, the emotional impact and secondly, talking to them about their wider wealth. So we say, well, actually, we've got a project that's going to cost £30,000 and this is what it's going to do or a programme for the next year. What you could do is go to the, those large donors and say, rather than you giving us cash or waiting until you've got something disposable or some reserves that you haven't thought of what you're going to do with, and I just happen to time it well. Let's be proactive again, rather than reacting to when they've got the opportunity. So often, this happens with a lot of my clients. You might think it's quite rare, but people do have a lot of assets that they either forget about or don't know what to do with. A big one is shares. So people have shares in companies, like Sage, for example, they have a, um, a company share scheme where employees can sign up, and you end up with shares in Sage. And often they just keep, they have no idea what to do with them or how to sell them. What they could do is rather than having that problem of actually finding someone like me to sell the shares for them and there's commission everywhere and there's sales fees and there's tax to pay and it becomes very complicated. There's a reason why people don't sell them because it makes it unattractive in the end. You can actually just gift the whole asset to a charity. So if my shares, I'd forgotten about these shares and they could be worth £10,000 and funnily enough, I do have shares in National Australia Group, a bank I used to work for years and years ago, and I have no idea how to sell them on the Australian Stock Exchange. <laughs> well, I do know how to do it. It's just going to cost me more money than it's worth. I could actually gift those in species to a charity, and the charity can then sell them. So I'm, from, to my mind, I'm passing something on. I'm giving the charity an asset, which, yes, you have to solve and sell, but it's tax efficient for me because I don't have to pay any fees for selling them down. I don't have to pay any tax and actually get tax relief as well. I don't want to get bogged down in the tax elements because really what I'm trying to do is find all these bits of paper or bits of assets that I have to meet your need. If I've got enough things in the background for £30,000, I might be more inclined to fully fund that project rather than just seeing what's already in my cash account. And I'm talking about small shares. The reason I did that on the life cycle basis is that as people get older, they do accumulate, they do inherit some assets that they really don't know what to do with. I was talking to someone last week who's got multiple properties and one of the properties they've got, they bought years and years ago and it's a commercial property worth, it's only about 40,000 pounds. I say only 40,000 pounds, it's a large amount, but they don't know what to do with it. They've never done anything with it for 40 years, as I said. And what you could do is just give that commercial property to the charity. The charity can then choose what to do with it. You could turn it into premises for yourselves, for trading activities, or you could sell it. And that would be a huge amount of money. And the people that I really want you to engage with on this are people like myself, the wealth managers, your tax accountants, your will writers, people who are talking to people about their financial affairs. 
and saying, well, what have you decided to do about this kind of asset that you've got? And this is where CC comes in really well is it's not about waiting until someone's gone. It's about managing everything in advance. Good financial advisors, good will writers will talk to people about everything they've got now and what their plans are. So it's bridging that gap really between death benefits and lifetime benefits. And if you can do that well and be proactive there, you're going to get more as a kind of legacy and more now. So again, I, did, I put a slide there and I started talking about tax, but really it's about managing people's assets and wealth and showing them the impact that those assets can have now rather than just sitting on them for years and years. So I don't know if that brings anyone to mind or any of your donors or an example, or if that's happened to you and someone has gifted an asset rather than cash funds in the past. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be amazing. Um, it's probably something that I've just never thought about as an option before. Um, but yeah, that's really interesting. We would love a new, we would love a new premises. So that would be marvelous <laughs> if anybody's sitting on a commercial property somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, there's a charity in Gosforth who were um, gifted their premises oh, really? from, from another foundation. So it, it, it does happen and it's surprising. And the thing that I think Cece is going to touch on more is about the events and how you can engage with people. Like I said, I'd be keen to work with, I've got some clients who I know are philanthropic and have the ability to give and want to know more about it. It's about engaging people like myself more and saying, right, if you get 10 clients in a room, let's have dinner with them. Let's have an online wine event. And we'll talk about what the charity does and how they can gift. And it's just joining up those expertise because there's some great financial impacts, but really it's the emotional side that you need to be talking to the clients about. And don't be scared to ask for those large gifts is probably my big takeaway. You'd be surprised kind of what comes out of things if you say it needs to be a £30,000 project and someone's got £10,000 in the bank they were going to give anyway, they might be able to find that extra 20000 from some assets that they have in the background as well. So that was everything from me. So I'll pass on to Cece for the last bit, the, the bit that I'm really interested in. I find this bit fascinating. Okay, I'm going to kick you out. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I've already introduced myself. But I just want to show you guys this picture of my dog wearing a dress. <laughs> uh, anyways, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, like I said, most of the things that I've done with charities have been like different sort of like events based things. And it's been um, interesting to speak to them and try to like make different like changes to this sort of like tried and true uh, formula of doing things. So what I've done um, and like Phil and I have done things together and, and I've done things separately just with charities on my own, um, but like co-hosting events, um, which goes it piggybacks right off of what Phil was saying earlier, because you sort of, you have like the financial aspect of it, but then you have the emotional aspect of it too. So it's all well and good for me to sit in front of a client and say, um, hey, have you thought about like leaving a, a legacy to charity? It's quite another thing for them to also have somebody from that charity in front of them and say, this is what we do, how we help X, Y, Z, um, and what your donation would be used for because it helps create that sort of emotional connection and say, right, this is like a real thing uh, that real people need and they like are making this help, um, making this money work to help others. Uh, Cause I think otherwise it can be just like a little bit abstract and like, I give like a five or a month to Marie Curie, like I'm good. You sort of like tick that box of like, yes, I donate to charity, I'm a good person, uh, which is fine, but we can do more. Um, so things that I found that really work um, to kind of incentivize people um, are to do like different giveaways um, or even offer sort of like donations for things. So for example, I've done like an in-person event at a, um, a restaurant and I just talked to the sales manager there and they were like, sure, I can give you a thing. And so they gave away a gift certificate um, as part of a raffle for dinner and drinks for two. 
um, that kind of thing would even work now and would probably be like restaurants would be even more keen to do something like that because they're trying to get people back through the door. Um, so different things like that are really good because you can just speak to somebody who's a sales manager somewhere and just like do a raffle, even if you do like raffle tickets or if you include it in part of like the ticket price for an event, even if it's an online event, like people will still like pay for tickets. And they're more inclined to do so if it's going as a donation to a charity and if they might win something. People love to win things. <laughs> so that's quite good. Um, and then also, I know I've done this before uh, with charities, is I've offered like if somebody writes a will and hopefully will leave a legacy to your charity in doing that, I'll donate like 10% of my fee for writing that will directly to the charity. So not only is it like the legacy to the charity later, but it's also like money in the pocket right then, which um, is great for the charity, but also is a great incentive for the person to like go ahead and write their will because, well, 10% of whatever I pay this person is immediately gonna go to this charity. So I get to give now and not pay anymore. So that's great. Um, and you can also create like if you didn't want to do an event or something like that, or you maybe just wanted to do an, a raffle or you just wanted to maybe like educate people, you could create a campaign specifically about writing wills, um, LPAs, protection, gift aid, all this stuff that um, Phil was talking about, um, as well as the sort of like typical estate planning things that you think about. Um, but the reason that I mention um, LPAs here, uh, lasting powers of attorney, uh, is because they can be just as important, uh, if not more important, as legacies to charity. Because if you have people who give regularly um, and then are suddenly unable to uh, make financial decisions for themselves, if they don't have an attorney in place to then do that for them and take over, then the charity can possibly <laughs> not receive those funds that they would normally get. So for example, um, my grandparents give to charity a lot, like quite regularly. And every Christmas they do this thing called um, Operation Christmas Child, which I don't know if, <laughs> if that's a thing here. Uh, it's quite big in the States. <laughs> okay, it's <laughs> just saying yes. Yeah, do it. Okay, right. Okay, so you do like the shoe boxes and the whole deal. So um, they do like shoe boxes for kids and you go and you buy like different things and you put it in the shoe box for like a different age group. And then it goes to an underprivileged area for a child to open and have a present on Christmas, which is really sweet. And they really love doing that. And they also give separately to that. So that's a thing that if they weren't able to uh, make those financial decisions for themselves anymore, uh, somebody who is close to them would know that that would be something that they would want to continue on doing. There are also other things uh, like a charity can become important to you because of something that's happened. So my mom had motor neuron disease um, and she passed away actually uh, 10 years ago to the day yesterday. And obviously that wasn't something that I, I did not even know it existed. I had never heard of like it as an illness before. I think more people are aware of it now because it like a few years ago they did like the ice bucket challenge and all of that stuff and like Robert Downey Jr. is like <laughs> dumping ice on his head and stuff. So people became much more aware that it existed. Um, but it doesn't necessarily make that emotional connection until you live it. So whereas at a point she wasn't able to make decisions for herself, that charity, uh, charities that kind of helped with motor neuron disease, different ones, but it was, it's called ALS in the States. So it's like the ALS Association. And then we ha they have like a local chapter. So we did a lot with that local chapter. <clears throat> um, I have a friend whose mom is in Marie Curie. So maybe that wasn't something that was super important to them before, but now suddenly it is. So they might would want to give to that charity or like um, what you were talking about, Lisa, uh, you know, people might not really be super concerned about what you guys do as learning disability charity, unless maybe they have like a family member or something who suddenly is aware of it or needs your services. Uh, I mentioned Grace House earlier. Um, my little nephew uh, has um, is on the autism spectrum, 
and his mom was really struggling over like the pandemic and everything <laughs> and and him not having that structure in place anymore was really really difficult and they were able to help him so different things sort of like happen in your life that make things important mm -hmm. and if it's a thing that makes that person unable to make those financial decisions if they don't have a lasting power of attorney in place then nobody can really give on their behalf like out of their money like they would like to do so that's why that's important. That's quite a long-winded way of saying that. <laughs> but the idea is to sort of like illustrate all the different reasons why this kind of goes together. And I think people don't really think about that. Um, and then, you know, obviously writing wills and things and leaving legacies, I think this is something that, <laughs> that most charities are quite familiar with. Um, I know charities who like, survive off of legacy donations um, and where I don't necessarily advocate that as like a business model <laughs> uh, it can be like quite good and helpful and it's also great for people like uh, what Phil was saying with like the tax things if you leave a 10% uh, legacy donation to charity then you get a break on your inheritance tax um, and where just like a few percent might not seem like a lot when you're talking about inheritance tax <laughs> you know, a few percent is quite a bit. <laughs> so that's, that can be really important too. If you have people who have sort of like multiple properties and different things, and they have like a larger um, estate where inheritance tax could be an issue, leaving a 10% legacy to charity is kind of a no brainer um, because it will reduce that inheritance tax right down. And then obviously you can, you can put other things in place. Uh, right. Okay. So Last thing um, is use your existing donors. So people who already donate to you already know who you are, already are familiar with your charity. Maybe it's like a tick box exercise thing. Maybe they're, um, I don't know, they do like the sponsored runs and stuff with you. You know what I mean? There's sort of like different levels of engagement, I, I suppose. But if people already know who you are, um, you could just encourage them to write their will, <laughs> leave this legacy to your charity. If you've partnered with a state planner who will do this, then they could possibly offer a discount to people, or not necessarily a discount, but like a donation. So like I was talking about before with like the 10% donation. So say I was like working with a charity and somebody came to me and said, um, yeah, I spoke with Lisa at Little LD Northeast and they, um, they suggested that I speak with you about writing my will, I'd be like, great. 10% of your fee for writing your will with me, I'm gonna donate directly to them. So that's great for you, that's great for them. You get that donation right right now, which is fab, money now is good. <laughs> um, but then you also are looking at a legacy uh, down the line as well. But it also sort of like plants this seed in their head even more of giving more at the time. So, mm -hmm. It's great because it's a way to connect with people who are already interested in what you do, get more now and then get more later as well. And it's just like, it's good advice. It's great service to the people who already are giving to you. Like, hey, did you know that if you leave this much as a legacy, then you can get this sort of like, I mean, obviously that's my job. That's not your, <laughs> that's not your job, but this sort of idea is just engaging with people who already are engaging with you. So whereas you can do these sort of like marketing things, you can do a raffle, you can do a webinar, you can do this other stuff. It's quite simple to either sort of like put some stuff together in the post or just shoot out a few emails to the people who like you already have in your database and say like, hey, have you been thinking about writing your will? And whereas, like you said, Lisa, that might not be super um, applicable to maybe the people who use their services, the family of the people who use your services might be quite interested in that. Um, and I think a lot of charities could probably relate to that, where it might not be um, the people who access the services. Like, obviously, the kids who go to Grace House uh, <laughs> aren't looking to write their wills, but their families are are really grateful for the support and want to then support the charity in return. So it's a great way to reach out and, and encourage that sort of thing. 
Um, so yeah, I think that's really all I wanted to go over, but I am curious um, if you've like considered when you're speaking to people or thinking about, I don't know if you have like an existing sort of legacy department, uh, some charities do, but if you thought about um, LPAs at all as like a branch of that. I think for, for me, again, it's, it's just getting started with all of this stuff. So we're, we're a relatively small charity um, and there is just me who is doing all of this stuff. Um, and we're just getting started with building up a donor database and all that kind of stuff because traditionally we've just survived predominantly on grant income in the past. Yeah. But we need, we need to widen that spectrum now. We can't just rely on stuff like that because projects will come to an end and there's so much more competition now for grant funding. There's no guarantee that we'll get continuation funding for our projects. Yeah. Um, so I'm working to try and get all of these things off the ground and I think probably with a lot of people legacy giving is something that I, I know how, how beneficial it can be for a charity because I used to work for Marie Curie right. the fundraiser and obviously they do brilliantly out of legacy giving mm -hmm. um, it's just how to introduce it and how to talk to people and how to do it in the right way and be sensitive about it so I, I would be very interested in kind of picking your brains and starting to explore that I think Sure. Yeah, I think that's sort of an issue that people have with it sort of in general, I think, is that it's it seems like, uh, you know, talking to people about dying is like, <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that, but I do it for a living. <laughs> I'm quite good at it. So I'd be happy to help you. But I think, you know, it's just you, you kind of have to be aware that obviously it can be quite emotive for some people and you do have to be sensitive about it. Um, but there is a way to talk about it. Um, it. It's like providing a service and providing education is the way that I like to think about it. Um, you know, if you were just going to do like some sort of raffle or just send out some marketing materials or whatever, or like an information booklet or something like that, it's not really forcing anybody to do anything, but I find that a lot of times this is on people's to-do list I say a lot of times, it, one is all the times, uh, it's something that people are like, oh yeah, I meant to do that. Um, and it can just be a way to sort of like, to push that. But obviously it's great because I can do, <laughs> or an estate planner, you know, it doesn't have to be me. Whoever you decide to work with can be that sort of like, I'm the financial person and I'm gonna to talk to you today about dying. And you can be like, look at my beautiful charity. So <laughs> it's a great way to sort of like yeah. balance that, make the other person handle all that stuff that you necessarily like wouldn't wanna talk about. But then you can just say like, this is all the work that we're doing. This is where your money goes. This is what we're doing, that kind of thing. And that's why it works really well to sort of have both sides of that because then you can just focus on your thing and then the estate planner can just focus on their thing. I was talking to yeah, a, good. a charity in Newcastle recently and they rely a lot on legacy mm -hmm. but what they found what I found interesting was that they've never met the people who are leaving a legacy so yeah. people are leaving legacies and not engaging with anyone they're not telling them they're going to leave it they're not even telling their family half the time as well so it's it's something people want to do, but people aren't actively speaking and promoting and engaging them prior to them dying, which is, I find a real shame. There's no one to thank afterwards. Yeah. So it's, it's like you said, a will is something that everyone should have and is talking about anyway. It's probably about talking to good will writers and saying, while you're having those conversations, why not talk about us as part of that? It's a tick box that you, CC will go through in terms of, if it's an actual conversation, would you like to give part of your estate? if she's also got something to back it up and say, well, you live in this area, this is a cause close to you. So yeah. it, it does work really well, but you're right. It's about making it sensitive. Mm. And it's, it's probably the biggest gift people will leave as well. There's a reason we structured the agenda in that way. It's about giving little and often payroll giving, giving more during your lifetime. And if you've done that and engage with those donors throughout that cycle, they'll give the most they can ever give upon death as well. Mm. So hopefully that's helped. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, I've just stuck my contact information and stuff on here. So, um, but anyways, it's quite easy to get in touch with me if, and both of us, if you need anything, just shoot us a message, email, whatever. We're both like super accessible. <laughs>
did y'all have any more questions about anything that we talked about or maybe didn't talk about that you just have a question? Um, I don't know. I don't think questions for me. I think I'll just, I'll probably follow up with both of you individually about payroll and about legacy afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. No okay. Thanks for your time. Good to speak to you, Ruth. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.